Well, hi everyone, it's Peter Jennings here, Executive Director of ASPE, and I'm joined with, by Marcus Helio, also from ASPE. Marcus, great to see you. you too, uh, it's been quite a remarkable few weeks uh, on things to do with uh, Australia's new alliance framework, AUKUS, uh, and in particular, of course, the decision that Australia is going to uh, look for options to develop nuclear propulsion for its uh, submarine fleet. Um, we thought it might be useful, Marcus, for ASPE's audience just to go through some of the, the technical issues here. Let's let's start by asking about submarines. What what's valuable about even conventional submarines from from an Australian defence perspective? Well, it's really I think two main reasons that uh, submarines would are good for Australia. The first reason is that they allow us to apply lethality at range. So it's about the only way we've got of actually um, deterring an adversary at long range from Australia, where we can actually sink an adversary ship or submarine at long range from Australia, you know, at ranges far beyond what our Air Force can achieve. The other uh, issue about submarines is because they're stealthy, is that they create uncertainty. So as soon as that submarine leaves its base near Perth, a potential adversary really doesn't know where it is very hard to detect it. And that will shape an adversary's calculus. They're gonna to have to take into account, they could be hit by a submarine at any time. And so for them to deal with that, they need to put a lot of resources into anti-submarine warfare, the kinds of capabilities that can detect submarines. And one of the things we know from history is that um, you have to put a lot more resources into detecting and defeating submarines than it costs to actually develop that capability in the first place. So they, they're a classic asymmetric capability. So Marcus, um, the arguments about uh, lethality and about stealth, they've, they've been with us really for as long as, they've, as, as submarines have existed, well, well over a century now. What's the... Um, add-on value that, that comes with nuclear propulsion? Well, because nuclear power gives you essentially unlimited energy, it, it means you can go much further, you can go much faster, so you can get to the kinds of places where we want to operate submarines to our north much faster, and once you get there, you can spend a lot more time on station. So, you know, roughly, you know, a, a conventional submarine operating from Perth, once it gets up to sort of those areas, strategic waterways to our, our north where you wanna operate submarines, it's basically got maybe 15 days on station before it has to turn around and come home again. A nuclear submarine potentially, you know, has up to 70 days on station. And that's because simply uh, of the endurance of the crew that, you know, they sort of reach their limits and they run out of food. It's not a limitation of the, the boat per se. So one boat gives you a lot more capability. And the other issue is because the submarine never has to surface, it's much more survivable. It's harder to detect because it doesn't have those vulnerabilities where it has to come close to the surface so it can bring in air to recharge its batteries. So you get a lot more capabilities, a lot more survivable. And, and as we go down the track, it's probably going to have a lot more ability to operate with unmanned systems as well because it's going to be bigger and carry more of them on board. So on, on balance, Marcus, would you say that eight nuclear-powered submarines is, is a, a, a more strategically useful asset than 12 conventionally-powered submarines, which was what was uh, in prospect with the attack-class submarine? Uh, my sense is yes. So you're going to get a lot more time on station. You, you're going to be able to cover a lot more ground. You'll, you'll get more days on station and those days I think will in a sense have better value um, so all things being equal it's probably a better capability the flip side is is it's going to cost a lot more money and nobody really knows at this point how much more money you're going to need more people to operate that and you're going to have a bigger overhead in the sense of all of the infrastructure you need to operate nuclear uh, boats safely um, you know, to meet all of our regulatory requirements, all of your non-proliferation requirements. There's a lot of overhead there. And I, I think we are just starting that journey of understanding what that costs. So this, we, we use the term national endeavor. 
I think a little lightly, but this will be a truly national endeavor. Uh, just quickly for our audience, can you uh, mention briefly some of the other technology elements that were part of the AUKUS package announced a, a, a week or so ago? Um, and I'm, in particular, I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, cruise missiles, uh, which, which would normally be a pretty major page one story in its own right, but tended to be lost a little bit in, in the wake of uh, nuclear propulsion. Mm, yeah, interesting, Peter. So, you know, Defence has sort of been pondering getting Tomahawk cruise missiles for a, a couple of decades now, certainly for as long as I've been around Defence, um, sort of ummed and out about it, and now it's finally getting them and it's sort of been lost in, in the news a bit. Look, I do, it's very consistent with the government's observation in last year's Defence Strategic Update. We need greater long-range strike capability and something like Tomahawk does give you sort of, you know, of long range, much longer than anything we've got at the moment. My concern is, is that the only ships we can carry them on are our three air warfare destroyers. So, you know, you don't have a very deep magazine there. So yes, it's, it's a good capability, but I think we need to find other ways to deliver that capability, whether it's surface launch missiles, so essentially off a, a vehicle or from an aircraft, I think we need to be looking a little more broadly there. But you, you raise AUKUS and, and the AUKUS is a much broader package than just SSN. So what, what are your views there? What, what's, what else is going on in, in AUKUS that you think is uh, significant? Because I think that one of the interesting things about AUKUS is that it's happening at all. Uh, you know, if you look at, particularly amongst the democracies, if, if you look at alliance building, the last time we had such um, uh, uh, creativity in alliance construction was around the uh, end of the Second World War and, and the early days of the Cold War into the early, early 1950s. That's where a lot of the alliance structures that are in existence amongst the democracies were put into place. In, in the last 12 months or so, we've had uh, the creation of the Quad, not quite an, uh, an alliance, but an interesting thing nonetheless when you have the President of the United States and the Prime Ministers of India, Australia and, and um, uh, Japan all together in Washington DC, clearly with an agenda to drive forward. Um, and then AUKUS, which does bring together, as it were, the A-list of the, uh, the Five Eyes uh, countries, so the US, Australia and the UK. I, I think what it reflects is just simply that we're in a, a, a time of great uh, strategic pressure and change in the international order. Clearly the focus here, even though the leaders don't particularly want to say it, is China, uh, the growing strength of an authoritarian China and the challenge that that presents to, to these democratic systems. So in one sense, we shouldn't be surprised to see uh, these groupings uh, be created. Uh, I, I think what's going to be interesting to test is, is how much survivability and, and longevity will, will any of them have. They're only going to work if they have practical agendas of deliverable outcomes. And I think that's where AUKUS is interesting because it's built around really not much more than a series of potentially deliverable outcomes. The submarines, science and technology, a closer collaboration, hypersonics, quantum uh, computing, all the areas that have been mentioned as, as potential deal breakers or deal shapers in international security now becomes, you know, the, the working focus of this grouping. It's, it's exciting. Uh, it's happening so quickly, it's hard to keep up necessarily with the fine detail. Um, and in fact, in lots of cases, I don't think there is much fine detail. It's all going to be worked out as we go along. Well, but we certainly, certainly haven't seen the plan for the SSNs yet. And, and you know what? I don't think there is a plan, Marcus. I think it is genuinely a case of let's discover what we can do about this over an 18-month period. And, so and to we me, said, that, that, that's the big challenge here. So we saw that the, the attack class submarine, the, the French design we're pursuing, we, we followed that. That survived one election cycle, and then we lost interest. All became too difficult or whatever. Uh, so if it's gonna take as close to 20 years to get the first nuclear boat into service, that's six election cycles. So keeping future governments and the Australian public behind this enterprise, I think is gonna be quite challenging. And I think the government and the Department of Defence really are gonna to have to work very hard to bring the Australian people on that journey with them. Because if they don't, the, the huge price tag, which, you know, in my view, will be well over $100 billion, you 
you know, is, is going to start to weigh very heavily against this enterprise. I, I'd agree with that, but I'd make the observation that if AUKUS breaks, ANZUS breaks, I think that th th it would be sufficiently momentous in, in, in its nature that it would actually bring serious question marks over the future of the Australian-US relationship. And I'm not saying that's impossible. I think when you're in a world as challenging as ours, that, that's when alliances really are uh, put to the test. But uh, th this is could not be more high stakes, uh, Marcus. I, mm, I agree. Well, uh, great conversation, Marcus. Um, I think we should thank probably have a few more of these for the Aspie audience. And uh, uh, to those Aspie folk out there, thanks for joining us.